The Laughing Man at Blackpool A Short Horror Story Written by Michael Vandervoort Narrated by Robin Reeds A historian's job is not simply to tell the story, but to tell the best version of that story, the one that is closest to the truth. Unlike a novelist or writer who can simply come up with a beginning, middle and end, arrange them into a neat linear narrative and call the job done, a historian has to assemble their story from a variety of disparate parts, assessing and evaluating sources to see how reliable they are, and stitching them together like a giant patchwork quilt to form a larger picture of what really happened. Not all sources are equal. Sometimes you're working with primary sources, photo and video evidence and contemporary documents. Sometimes it's eyewitness testimony from close to the time. On other occasions, the evidence is sparse or detached, separated from the events themselves by decades of time and false memories. No history is 100% true. There is always a subjective bias, an angle or a perspective, all of history, all of it, as recorded and reported, is, at best, based on a true story. The one I'm about to tell you is just such a story. I know that it's true, not only because I have hard evidence, or because the people I spoke to, the eyewitnesses, had no reason to lie, but because I saw some of these things with my own eyes— this is as close to a true story as history could ever be. I give you my word. Sometimes, though, especially for a historian, a word is not enough. So I want to start by asking something of you, the reader or the viewer. I want you to do something for me. If I'm going to tell this story, then we need to have a few things clear at the outset— we simply can't start with you thinking from the start that the whole thing is just a story, something that I made up, just another bit of disposable fluff on the internet that you can listen to or read and then ignore because it's all just a bit of fun, all just made-up nonsense. I can't have you thinking that. I can't have it because what I'm going to tell you isn't nonsense, and it certainly isn't made up. Now, I know that there are hundreds of stories, particularly horror stories, on YouTube and Reddit that claim to be true. Some of them actually have titles like Five Scary True Stories, but it's pretty obvious after only a few seconds that they are no such thing. This isn't one of those stories, and we can't start off with you thinking that it is. So, before we start, I want you to check a few things. First, I want you to go to Google and look up The Laughing Man at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. You should be able to find a few videos straight away, most of them only about 30 seconds long that will show you, clear as day and on film, that what I'm going to talk about is no figment of my imagination. What I'd prefer you to do is to wait until you're alone, preferably at night, and then, with your headphones in and the volume up, to click on one of those videos. I want you to look at that thing and listen very carefully to how it laughs. If you did as I asked, then I imagine you already have questions. What the hell is that thing? Who put it there? And why in God's name do they keep it? I'll answer those questions in time, but first I have to acknowledge the fact that some people are stubborn. For those of you thinking, oh, I'll do it later, or I'll see where the story goes and maybe check it out at the end. I'll make you this promise. If you see this story through to the end, then by the time we finish, you won't need me to ask you. You'll want to check for yourself. Still, for those people who haven't clicked on the stories yet, I should probably describe what you'll see. What you'll find in those videos and images is not some made-up monster or crappy AI image, what you'll see is proper video footage of a dummy, an animatronic. The footage is from an amusement park in the northwest of England called Blackpool Pleasure Beach. What you'll see in the footage isn't much of the park, perhaps the outlines of a few roller coasters or attractions in the background, but what you will see more clearly 
is a moving, life-size mannequin throwing itself backward and forward while laughing hysterically in a horrible, manic chuckle. Usually, these videos come with a subtitle or comments that say things like, Who else was scared of the laughing man? Or a story of how the person who filmed when he was a kid used to dare his mates to run up and touch it. Some mention how, as kids, they would love to visit the pleasure beach, but would sprint past the display case holding the laughing man, and that the face, and particularly the laughter, would creep back into their thoughts later that night, when they were back home safe, alone in the dark. The locals call the dummy the laughing man, but he's also known as the mad clown, the laughing clown, or the laughing jester. This is likely due to the fact that the dummy's costume and even his hairstyle and colour is changed every six or seven months. At times he looks more like a jester, and sometimes more like a clown, other times even like a king. Whatever he is dressed in, however, he is always, always laughing. It isn't a nice laugh, either. The dummy itself is about the size of an average person, and it sits inside a six-sided glass display case, like some animal you'd see in a cage up the road in Blackpool Zoo. It sits inside this box on a heavy, straight-backed chair, a bit like a throne, as if the court jester had somehow managed to steal the king's seat when the regent's back was turned. There's a mechanism below the chair that makes it swing and rotate in these horrible, jarring motions from side to side. As it does, the mummy lurches forward, its hands gripping onto the arms of the chair as it folds at the middle, rocking and lolling backward and forward, flinging its head and jerking its torso so violently that if it were a real person they'd end up hurting themselves. Thing is, you get the feeling that if this was a real person, he'd be far beyond caring. It's the face, you remember. The face and the laughter. You would imagine that whoever painted the god-awful thing back in the early 1910s would have painted it to look jolly or happy. Without a convincing smile or look of happiness, you'd assume the thing would be hard to sell. If that is what the artist was going for, then they certainly missed their mark. The laughing man does not look happy, in any normal sense. As you'll know if you've looked at the footage, there is something distinctly deranged about his appearance, some touch of madness that seems just at its edges to be tinged with the rot of malice and evil. The laughing man's mouth, which I suppose is meant to be open as if he's rolling about laughing, looks objectively and proportionally wrong. It's too wide, too fixed, it's a horrible, rictus grin that looks as if the person wearing it has been forced to smile by the tip of a blade, and has died with an unnatural, gurning smile on their face. The mouth itself has a row of straight white teeth, framed with garish red lips, like the makeup of a clown. That would be bad enough, but above that are the eyes. Wild, staring eyes. Now, most people, when in fits of laughter, close their eyes, or at least crease them up, tears streaming down their cheeks as they go into hysterics. If you were going to draw, paint, or carve someone in fits of laughter, the cheeks would come up and the eyes would look at least half closed. We know this instinctually. That's why there is something so unsettling about the sight of someone laughing with their eyes wide open. Mad eyes, wider than they should ever really be, as if it's what they've seen that's made them laugh like that, with that horrible, bellowing cackle. That's what his eyes are like. The origin of the laugh itself is the subject of some debate. As you'll hear on the videos, it's a hideous, over-amplified croak that seems to ring far more with cruelty and mockery than it ever does with mirth. Naturally, there has always been some conjecture as to where the recording might have come from, and you'll find it debated on Reddit and Fortean message boards. As early as the 1940s, rumours began circulating that the recording of the madman's laugh was made by a bona fide lunatic. Of course, that sounds ridiculous, until you learn that in the mid-1920s, recordings were indeed made of the inmates at the nearby Royal Albert Asylum in Lancaster. This is a real place, and there is documentation proving that these recordings existed. Still, 
The idea that the laughter of an inmate would end up at an amusement park seems implausible. Unfortunately, it becomes more plausible when you learn that the account records for the Pleasure Beach, available for view at the Blackpool Public Library, show a cost in 1935, the same year that the dummy was acquired, for an unspecified product, written in the accounts simply as laughter sound. The cost comes from a supplier not used at any other point in the park's history and listed only as the Albert Lancaster. Again, all of this can be checked and verified. OK, you might say. It is clear that the weird doll does exist, that it is still at the park and it's a bit creepy looking. So what? Well, that's just the start. The next thing I want you to look up is the Blackpool Pleasure Beach Funhouse Fire. And if you want to save yourself a bit of time, add in the words Laughing Man. Now, if I had told you right at the start about a seaside amusement park called Blackpool Pleasure Beach, those of you who had never heard of it before would probably think even that was made up. Blackpool already sounds like the name of a setting in some pulpy horror novel. But I guarantee you... It's a very real place. A big attraction for Victorian holiday makers, it still attracts tourists to this day, and is famous for having a huge iron tower, a little like a down-market version of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, that at one time had both a circus and a ballroom inside it. The tower is one of the most recognisable landmarks in the north of England, and can be seen for miles around. In fact, for most kids on their way to visit Blackpool, the tower becomes part of a game, as parents challenge the young ones to be the first to spot the tower. Overall, Blackpool as a town is hard to explain. Even though everything on the front, close to the sea, is geared towards tourism, it's a cheap, tacky and dog-eared kind of glamour. A friend of mine once said that if all the showbiz and razzmatazz of a 70s British game show could be wrapped up and reshaped into a town, then what would emerge would be Blackpool. The problem is, whilst that shoestring budget entertainment might have been just about passable in 1974, 50 years later, nothing had changed. The entertainment featuring D-list celebrities advertised on cardboard cutout posters, slot machine arcades, gaudy hand-painted attractions and greasy fast food stalls, all leading up to tired-looking booths where gypsy fortune tellers offer to read your palms, looked dated 30 years ago. Now they just look sad. And yet, despite all of this, Blackpool still attracts a steady influx of tourists every year, mostly people who have heard of the place and who are curious, or those who know all too well and, having grown up loving the place for its budget thrills and slightly tacky attractions, know what to expect. This type of tourist loves Blackpool for the tongue-in-cheek nostalgic kitsch of the place, and, of course, central to this tourist trade is the Pleasure Beach. Opened by A.W.G. Bean in 1896, the park hosts Europe's oldest amusement park ride, dating all the way back to 1904, and what at one time was home to the tallest and steepest roller coaster in the world. The park, which retains many of its Victorian and Edwardian wooden features, has stood on the same spot on Blackpool's south shore, attracting punters for over a century, the majority of those years having been soundtracked by that awful, malevolent laughter. Now, back to the research. It might be worth mentioning at this point that my own interest in the Laughing Man came almost by accident. I was at Blackpool Pleasure Beach conducting research for a book on the famous ghost stories linked to the park, most of which centred around the ghost train, which is one of the oldest in the world, and arguably the prototype upon which all other ghost trains have been based. Arranging interviews with past and current workers at the park, I expected to be regaled with tales of spooky goings-on inside the ride itself, and to find slightly schlocky reporting of such incidents in the local papers. What surprised me was that not one of the people I spoke to about strange occurrences mentioned the ghost train, or Coggy the ghost that was supposed to inhabit it. Instead, almost every creepy anecdote, every story of strange occurrences, related back to the Laughing Man, and also to his tiny companion. 
I cannot tell you the number of people I spoke to who complained that, whilst making their rounds at night, when the park was quiet, the rides all closed and the lights shut off, they had walked past the laughing man and felt as if they were being watched. Perhaps more striking than that is the number of witnesses who will still swear with hand on heart that there is some kind of mechanical problem with the dummy that makes it let out peals of laughter even after it has been shut down and unplugged. It shouldn't happen, one former employee told me on tape. But sometimes you walk past it doing your rounds and you feel it looking at you, even with your back to it. Now obviously you'd think, oh don't be daft, you're just winding yourself up. But then he'd walk on a bit and the bloody thing would start laughing. It happened to me twice. I'd spin around and shine my torch in it and sure enough he'd be sat there where he always was, still as anything. But it had laughed. It sounds stupid, but you could still feel the noise in the air, you know, like the vibrations or whatever. Now I'm not soft, but I'm telling you now, you try walking round a fairground at night, in the dark, it's bloody creepy at the best of times. There's something not right about that thing. Another, a Mrs. Bexley who worked at the park for over 14 years, told me virtually the same story. I don't know if it's because it's mechanical and not like proper electric, but whatever it is, the bloody thing used to move. I was working in the Horseshoe Bar at the time, which is part of the complex on the Pleasure Beach, but it's open later. Now, you weren't really supposed to cut through the park at the end of the shift, but the security lads would always let you because otherwise you'd have to walk all the way round. Anyway, you cut through and walk as fast as you could, and you'd have to walk past the dummy, and every single time you'd see it out the corner of your eyes, he was walking up. By the time you got there, it'd have moved. Just a bit, not loads, but it'd sort of shift and move in its chair, like it was trying to get a better look at you. Loads of the security lads said it used to laugh, that they'd be doing their rounds, walking between all the stalls and the rides and checking stuff with a torch, and they'd hear it. Sometimes they'd hear it from miles away, on the other side of the park. Sometimes just after they'd walk past. They all hated it. But Nibblet were worse. Now, you might be wondering who or what a Nibblet might be. We'll get to that, I promise. First, back to the facts. If I had told you at the start that one of the oldest and most famous attractions at the Blackpool Pleasure Beach, the old Fun House, mysteriously burnt down in the early 90s, you might think it sounded like a cliché, something you'd find in a creepy story, but which was unlikely to actually be true. Still, it's not completely implausible, and some of you may have been prepared to believe it. But what if I then added a detail? What if I told you that the only thing to survive the massive fire was the Laughing Man dummy? At that point I'm sure most of you would be crying B.S., right up until you checked. Go ahead. I'll wait. What you'll see from just a quick search on Google is that I'm not making it up. That, in amongst the ashes of the old wooden funhouse, where every timber was charred black and the attraction completely destroyed, the one thing that miraculously managed to survive was the wild-eyed, smiling face that laughed to see the flames. Somehow, the laughing man, which had been positioned in front of the funhouse, endured. If you bring up the papers from the time, or the article from the Blackpool Gazette titled The Night the Fun Died, you'll see the famous photo. A fireman, standing there in his bright yellow gear, all that black and smouldering ash around him where the funhouse used to be, and you'll see, tucked under his arm, the untouched, undamaged head of the laughing man, its wild mad eyes still staring, with a huge smile on its face. It sounds made up, but it's not. You can check. While you're there, you might as well check what happened on the 31st of August, 2000. To save you some time, you can look at Blackpool Pleasure Beach on Wikipedia, and scroll down to the section that covers Incidents. You'll see that on that day there was an accident on the Pleasure Beach's biggest attraction, the roller coaster known as Big One. At one time, this was the tallest and steepest roller coaster in the world, and was a huge draw for the park. What you'll read on Wikipedia is how a mechanical failure on the brakes led two of the carriages to crash disastrously into each other, injuring 23 people. 
What you won't read about there, but which you can find if you dig a little deeper, is the fact that the night before that incident, the police were actually summoned to the pleasure beach after hours by the nighttime security staff. Again, this is part of the public record. The police, however, were not summoned to the park because of some sabotage, some intruder, or anything relating to the big one, but because one of the staff had called to report vandalism to the Laughing Man display. Part of it was missing, and assumed stolen. Now, if you go back and look at the images and footage of the Laughing Man, you'll notice that he is not alone in his glass cage. Sitting on the Laughing Man's knee, in full costume and with an equally manic smile, is another little man, a tiny clown. The face of this figure is oddly less human-looking. It comes to a strangely pointed shape at the front and resembles, some have said, the protruding snout of a goblin shark. What, exactly, this small figure is intended to actually be is not clear. If it is supposed to be a child, then why is it dressed in the same clothes as the Laughing Man, with a clown's painted face? Why does it have the proportions of an adult rather than a child? Is the smaller figure meant to be a dummy or puppet controlled by the Laughing Man, something that might be used in an act of wrenchwiloquism? Or is it intended to be some kind of sprite or spirit of laughter? The role of this figurine and why it was included at all remains a mystery. What is not a mystery, and what becomes very clear when you speak to witnesses directly, is that it was this figure that scared the park workers most, particularly those who worked security at night. Amongst those who have worked on the pleasure beach, both in daylight and after hours, the little man has a reputation even more sinister than that of his larger companion. To the staff and locals living in the Blackpool area, the smaller figure is known as Niblet. It was also the part of the Laughing Man display reported missing the night before the accident, though by the time the police arrived, it was happily back in its box. We can be certain of this for two reasons. Firstly, there is a police report, and, since it is part of public record, it can be viewed and verified if you inquire about a file request. Secondly, there is the worker who called in the incident, a man named Paul Metcalf. Having interviewed Mr. Metcalf about the incident, I am very confident that what he says is true. According to him, for a period of around two hours, Niblet was missing from the case. I thought someone had nicked it, he told me. Took it away like a souvenir or something. I mean, there's all the stories about it and that, but I wasn't bothered about them. I just thought it had been pinched, you know. And that stuff's been there since the thirties. It's valuable. So I rang it in. I went back to the hut where we had the security desk and waited for the coppers to turn up. Anyway, they got there about two hours later. I went down to show them, and bugger me if the thing isn't right back where it was supposed to be. I looked a right fool, but I'm telling you, on my kids' lives, when I did my rounds an hour or two earlier, that bloody nibbler thing wasn't there. As proof that this incident did take place, Mr. Metcalf has a copy of the disciplinary warning he received days later from Pleasure Beach Management. He was given a written warning for having summoned the police for no reason. I have seen this document, and, again, it can be viewed upon request. It is also worth noting that there have been a number of occasions you can read about on Google, upon which Niblet and even the entire Laughing Man dummy have been reported missing from their case. On one occasion, both figures, moved presumably by drunken pranksters, were missing for an entire night, only to be found the following morning standing in a corner of one of the ghost train displays. Whether the dummy actually was missing is, of course, up for debate, as it cannot be proven either way. What can be proven, though, is that the smaller dummy definitely was reported missing the night before the incident. It can also be proven that Mr. Metcalf was disciplined for inaccurate reporting. The fact that this strange incident occurred the night before one of the worst accidents in the park's history is regarded by those in charge as a coincidence. The interesting question is, 
If Mr. Metcalf was right and the doll was missing, as he insists, then did the same person who temporarily removed it also tamper with the mechanisms on the rides? Such a question would be easy to answer were it not for the fact that, as noted in the insurance claim documents for several of those injured in the crash, the security footage from that night for the entire park is missing. What might have been on that footage most can only guess. I, however, have a little more insight. Around three months after the Big One crash, I was still conducting my research on the park and its folklore. I had shifted my attention, based upon the reports, to the Laughing Man, based upon the reports, to the Laughing Man, and had begun digging into the thing's origins. I found out that it had been brought to the park in 1935, apparently from France. According to one account, the original dummy itself is far older than this and had once occupied a space at a recreational garden in Paris. The laughter track was added later, but apparently the head of the dummy, its display case, and niblet were all over fifty years old at the time of purchase. One historian I contacted in France claims to have a painting of a town carnival from 1840 that shows the mechanical laughing man as one of the attractions, though I am yet to see this painting for myself. Over the course of those three months, and particularly after other workers got wind of Mr. Metcalfe's story, Others came forward with their own tall tales. Many confirmed the idea that, on occasion, the dummy was known to laugh of its own accord. Others told me of how the cleaning staff often found mice and other small animals dead in front of the display case. One lady I spoke to on record even claimed that on several occasions bits of animals were found inside the case itself. I found a whole cat's leg on Niblet's lap once. A back leg. Just that. Nothing else. Christ knows how it got there, or what happened to the rest of the cat. But it might explain why they change the thing's costume and get-up every few months. I mean, there's no real need to do that, is there? Unless it's getting dirty or stained somehow. The somehow in that statement links to my own personal experience at the Pleasure Beach. Having decided to make the Laughing Man the focus of my work, I asked the management if I might be allowed to photograph the thing at night and interview the security workers. Management agreed, though several workers warned me against it. I don't know about finding bits of cats, one told me. If I tell one thing, there's some bloody funny-looking cats running about in there at night. At first, I didn't quite understand what he meant by this, until one of his colleagues clarified, "'Yeah, funny-looking cats. They run about on two legs.' He further explained that many workers claimed to have seen similar things, either on camera or with their own two eyes. Something, standing upright and no bigger than a large house cat, scurrying and rushing between the rides. "'I was up by the Big Dipper,' said one man whose testimony I have recorded." and I was just on my way back when I saw someone moving about behind me. I didn't see it straight on, mind. It was in the reflection in one of the booth windows, but I still saw it. Now everybody's told me it were a cat or a dog or whatever, but I'm telling you now, I looked in that window and, well, it were a little man. Like somewhat from one of them Punch and Judy shows. About two foot tall. It ran out from behind the bin and then ran off behind one of the stalls. That was the last time he ever did one of them rounds. I moved to the day shift the next morning. Sold that for a game of soldiers. I said at the start that a historian has to be picky about what sources he includes, that he must weave his story carefully, relying on worthy sources. I'm sure that by now some of you will think I've strayed from that goal. But I'll tell you why I haven't. Because I believe every word that these eyewitnesses told me I believe them, because I've seen it for myself. The night before I was scheduled to take my photographs, I visited the security booth and met the staff who would be taking me around after closing time. The security centre, or hut as they called it, was positioned toward the front entrance of the park, 
but since I had spent the day talking to the workers on the ghost train at the other end of the pleasure beach, getting to the hut meant crossing the park long after closing. By the time I set off on the walk from one side to the other, the sun had already gone down. In some corners, a cleaner could be spotted still shuffling around, sweeping litter into a dustpan or checking the external locks on a ride, but for the most part the place was deserted. To say that the place wasn't already a little eerie would be a lie. During the day, the pleasure beach is a cacophony of noise, laughter, screams, music, and sound effects competing from the rides, and tinny, over-amplified music blaring out from every speaker. Throw in the smells of doughnuts and candy floss, the barrage of garish colours from prizes and rides, all screaming for attention, and the entire place is an overload for the senses. Until it's not. There is always something about visiting a place usually filled with people and activity when the people have been removed that renders it instantly unsettling. Whilst they are empty in a very literal sense, there is more to it than that. A cavernous, hollow sense of absence creeps across the place, as if the soul and the flesh have been removed, and now only the echoes and bones that remain. They are too still, too empty. At night the contrast is stark. Walking along promenades usually alive with people and hearing your own footsteps is a strange experience, which is not to mention the way the darkness plays with the shapes. The fiberglass figures, mannequins and dolls, the landscapes and ornaments that look surreal and whimsical in the daytime look dark and sinister in the half-light. It was therefore a welcome surprise for me to see that up ahead, across the narrow bridge that led me past the old Tunnel of Love ride, the glow of at least one electric light was still on. It was only when I reached the other side of the bridge that I realised where that light was coming from. Whilst the entire rest of the park had been closed down, switched off and unplugged for the night, the old glass display case, up on its wooden moorings with its six transparent sides, was still lit with a single yellow bulb. Inside, the laughing man, whose sound effects and mechanics had clearly been shut off, lay slumped to one side, his head lolling slackly over one shoulder, mouth still fixed in that awful grin, and his mad eyes still staring. From my position at the bottom of a slight incline, the top half of the dummy looked like a gigantic jack-in-the-box that, having sprung up to make its surprise, now flopped, redundant and boneless, hanging over the side. I took a few steps forward, then stopped, aware now not only of the sound of my footsteps, but knowing deep down that I was attempting to put as much distance as possible between myself and this thing. I remembered again how children would run past him, how their smiles would evaporate and they would grow suddenly subdued, huddling around their parents' legs when forced to walk near the thing. It really was a hideous object. The downward light, fixed in position as it was above the figure, somehow made it look even worse, painting the features with long, palsied shadows that seemed to drip and melt off the carved contours of the face. I'm happy to admit that for a long moment I paused in front of that thing on its throne and felt suddenly very alone. Looking around me for some other soul, a cleaner, a security guard, any shuffling someone who might also be here after hours, I found no one. So instead I moved, slowly and somewhat gingerly toward the seated figure, walking in a long, extended horseshoe around the thing, so as to be as far from it as possible. Why? I asked myself. Did I really think it would reach out toward me? That it might, in a slow, deliberate motion, ease itself up to standing, pushing off from the arms of the chair and step clumsily toward me? Why? I asked myself over and over. When every other ride had been shut down, would this one light remain on, leaving this grotesque thing to slump and gloat. A careless cleaner or attendant? An oversight by whomever had been given the responsibility of turning the damn thing and its mechanism off? Clearly it had to be one of those two options. 
but for some reason that light being on shook me far more than it should have. Not just because of the laughing man, but because of Niblet. For while the larger man looked empty and melted in place, the tiny facsimile Niblet remained upright and attentive, looking for all the world like some pixie or demon resting on the lap of someone he had just dispatched, the two wide grin and row of tiny teeth suggesting that he would simply laugh and gloat at such an occurrence. I couldn't help as I moved around, imagining those tiny teeth, like those of an infant, biting into my calf. I swallowed hard and told myself that I was being stupid, that I should grow up and grow a pair, as I moved more hurriedly past the laughing man, the stupid dummy in his stupid box, and, just as I had reached the point where I could put the thing behind me and rush off toward the security hut, I saw on the surfaces before me a shift and change in the shadows. The light in the display box had gone out. I turned slowly and looked back at the laughing man. There he was, silent and in situ, still with the devilish imp resting on his lap, but now in darkness. Perhaps, I thought, the light was on a timer or a motion sensor. Perhaps the lights had been switched off at the mains somewhere else in the park, and the whole thing was just a coincidence. Still, it was a coincidence that made my stomach flip. The thought that the light had gone off just after I had passed, suggesting that it had also been turned on for me and me alone, was unnerving. I never told the men in the security hut about the light. Instead, I pretended like nothing had happened, and like I wasn't in any way disturbed by the laughing man. That was until around 11 p.m. I was midway through a conversation about the old Tunnel of Love ride when one of the men called me over to a CCTV monitor and pointed. He told me to watch in the bottom left corner, adding no other comment than, He's at it again! What I saw on the screen, darting between the walls and the supporting struts for the rides, looked in some ways like a child, but far smaller and done up in fancy dress. The image was blurry in the dark, but I could see clearly that the figure, only around a foot and a half tall, was wearing a tiny clown outfit. I felt as if I would be sick. Reeling back, I looked at the other men also watching the footage. After a few seconds, one of them announced that I had better get a good look. Management will erase that tomorrow, he said, straight-lipped and terrified, slowly shaking his head. He never did explain why. You'd be better off coming back tomorrow to take your pictures, lad, he added, when all the bits that should be there are where they should be. Despite what was written on the duty rotor stuck up on the wall for all to see, none of those men left the hut that night. In fact, they locked the door from the inside, they didn't give a reason why, and I didn't ask. To me it seemed fairly obvious. There were things moving out there that shouldn't be. The following night I took my photographs. I was with two other workers, both of whom said without a moment's hesitation that they blamed the laughing man for the crash and several other incidents at the park over the years. One told me that the day after the crash they had found several bolts, gears, and fragments of structural machinery inside the display box. It's like he took em and kept em. I reckon he does it a lot when he's out on his errands, he said. He also mentioned that malfunctions on the rides were far more common than we know. He mentioned that after the big one crash, the park had hired eight more mechanics and instructed them to thoroughly check each of the large roller coasters every morning looking particularly for missing pieces. Why, and indeed how, vital pieces of a ride could go missing in the night is anyone's guess. My companion had his own rather strange theory about that, though, of course, I have no way of proving it. What I can prove, by way of photographs sent to me by individuals still working at the Pleasure Beach, is that the management have taken their own special precautions, Whilst changing the costume on the Laughing Man dummy, a worker noted that some alterations had been made to the display. 
the photographs confirm that, as of late 2023, whilst the laughing man can still be seen rocking backward and forward in his case, he is now actually welded into the seat, his feet bolted to the floor. Niblet, meanwhile, a tiny accessory that should be of no real concern to anyone, has been nailed firmly in place, with each tiny leg strapped to the surface below with thick steel cables fixed to Laughing Man's lap. Some would say this is a precaution against theft and a very natural move to make. All I will say is that clearly someone is very keen to ensure that these figures remain exactly where they are. This has been The Laughing Man at Blackpool Written by Michael Vandervoort Narrated by Robin Reeds Copyright 2024 by Michael Vandervoort Production Copyright by Michael Vandervoort